and it's going on with great abundance. You can see that in another two weeks, the soybeans will have sprawled all over underneath there, and the corn will be up this high and really go, getting going, and weeds are just not a concern. They add a little spice to the soup. And if you had a place where the crows managed to pick out your corn seed, then the weeds will take up the slack. So, <clears throat> People used to ask me, oh, what do you do about weeds? And I'd say, I watch them. And, but don't you do something about them? Well, let me tell you, observation is the basis of intelligence. You won't know what those weeds are telling you unless you watch them. So silica here, to review, silica is responsible for catching carbon via the warmth and light in the atmosphere. Next slide. And lime is responsible, that's too fast, too fast. Okay. is responsible for nitrogen fixation via the tone and life in the soil. Next slide. And clay provides the give and take that ramps up the dynamic interplay between atmospheric warmth and light and the soil's tone and life. And to feed the soil food web with insoluble but available nutrients, as you would with humified compost, establishes habitats for digest and establishing the habitats for digestive organisms. And that's what that little low canopy of pumpkins and weeds and stuff in the picture was. This will defeat weeds, pests, and diseases for pennies on the dollar. So, now, we, I want to move on to more of the story because I've just barely scratched the surface here. And I've got this Mandelbrot set figure here again. That life arises at boundaries, but I've got it in color. And the color, you can imagine, is representing additional dimensions beyond the three that we're accustomed to thinking about. So I just want to introduce the idea that there's stuff going on in more dimensions than just three. Process and substance. Huh? Okay. okay, now we've got the elements and we're familiar with this and they are three dimensional. And we've got classical philosophy looked at this as the fire element, the air element, the water element, and the earth element. And fire, which related to sulfur, air to nitrogen, water to hydrogen, and earth to carbon. Okay, because those particular things in the periodic table are characteristic of what we think of as the radiant, gaseous, liquid, and solid states. Okay. In the periodic table, nitrogen is actually a one-dimensional element because it's just a single vortex spinning on a single axis. And so if you looked at the axis, you would only see a point. In fact, it's so infinitesimal that you wouldn't see it. Your second, your first octave in the periodic table here is actually your chemical elements, and they set a pattern like a sine wave would be a pattern. And it's two dimensional. And this is where you find boron and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and fluorine. And these are two dimensional elements, but they set the patterns for the same kind of reactions that will occur chemically with the outermost electrons of the atoms in their column below. So the pattern that lithium has as an, uh, as an elect electrolyte is then shown as a physical element in sodium. And so you see magnesium is, this, is very similar, see, to beryllium and calcium and boron is very similar to aluminum and carbon to silicon, nitrogen to phosphate, oxygen to sulfur, fluorine to chlorine. So your physical elements there, which are in great abundance in the Earth's crust, uh, in addition to the carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and whatnot, these physical elements we see as three-dimensional. 
but they're the basis of mineral uh, formations in the soil, but they're not sufficient in and of themselves for life to occur. That happens with the next, the fourth dimensional octave of elements. And this is where we see the transition metals such as iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc that are important as cofactors for enzymes for life processes. And so we don't really, until we reach potassium and calcium as fourth dimensional elements, we don't have enough going on there for plant life to occur. Plant life is something that has a continuum, a life span. And that life span has duration. It starts with seed and it goes through the germination, the development of the cotyledons, the leafy growth of the plant, and eventually it's blossoming once it's built up enough energy and that's where it gives off energy and it consolidates its activity in the formation of fruit and seed. And there's a treatise written by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe who is philosophically very important in the development of the science of biodynamic agriculture and it's a description of the process that all plants go through in various ways, but it's still the same process that they go through in going from seed to seed. If you take a photo or if you pin a specimen of a plant to a board, you don't have the plant. You only have its corpse or its image. The life process has fled. So to have an insight into that continuum that the process of the plant is in its entirety from seed to seed is fourth dimensional. We can conceive it in our thought, but we will not, will not see it in any given instance because it involves a dimension of time. Now beyond that, we have consciousness, the ability to inwardly see what is an outward phenomenon. And that involves an additional dimension represented in the picture by color. But what we will see in animals is they have, instead of like the plant which just absorbs everything from its surroundings, the animal actually goes out and seeks it and ingests it and digests it and receives the outward world into its core and generates its nutrition from within its digestive tract or its digestive processes in the case of amoebas and hydras that don't actually have an alimentary canal. But animals develop out of this, they develop a higher faculty, a fifth dimensional faculty of perception and desire. They actually seek out things that they desire and they can detect them through sensory uh, observation. So when we're talking about consciousness, we're actually talking about a fifth dimensional activity. And with consciousness, we can think about, we can grasp the idea that the plant is fourth dimensional. But from the plant's point of view, it doesn't know this. An animal has an awareness. The plant is, of course, responsive to all the phenomena around it. But it isn't able to go after it, and it isn't able to ingest it. So we're talking about an animal activity there in the what's called the astral uh, elements. And this includes iodine, which is important for animals to preserve their integrity, their immune system, 
but it's not really important for plants. So such things as rubidium or for that matter silver or even cadmium. These are elements that, well arsenic, uh, sorry is a plant one, um, indium is below gallium there and it's important for animals but it's not important really for plants. So we're looking at extra dimensions in the periodic table. These get very rarefied when we get to the sixth layer and human beings are aware that they are aware and they can take a hand in their further development. A cow is not striving to be anything other than a cow and yet human <coughs> beings are always striving to be more than what they are. They might be striving to be more evil than they are, but they might also strive to be better than they are. And so human beings experience shame, which you'll never even see in a cow, uh, and they experience pride, and they experience purpose in life. And so this is actually a sixth dimensional activity. So when we're looking at the periodic table, it tells us out here that we have these sorts of things going on. In each layer, there is a new envelopment of the levels of uh, atomic uh, uh, electron shells, so that each layer is an envelopment of the previous layer. So, not to get too far off into chemistry, yes. let's go to the next slide. The ethers here, which are fourth dimensional, uh, warmth is what we see in the ripening of grains, light is what we see in the blossoming process, tone is what we see in the chemistry that goes on in the leafy uh, portions of plants, and life is what's occurring actually in the soil. The buildup of carbon, the basis of living organisms, is occurring in the soil with the growth of plants. And that's what we're looking at in terms of what biodynamics calls the ethers. Okay, now you also have in biodynamics what's called the astrality. This is the animal <coughs> consciousness, the sense and desire, nature. And this flows into our... Uh, into our realm from the neighborhood of the stars and it flows in through the planetary vortexes so your outer planets here the planets beyond the Sun and Earth Mars Jupiter and Saturn are actually channels for warmth to spiral into the solar system and it goes through each of these planetary vortexes and as it spirals into the sun, it's spiraling through the earth. And so we're receiving the influences of these outer planets through the body of the earth. And then it spirals on out as warmth and light, and it spirals towards the sun. Now the sun stands in the middle of the solar system, and it's concentrating, warmth is concentrated into light, and light ether is concentrated into tone ether in the sun. And the sun has, if you could observe it in space, it has a tone quality. <clears throat> and this is reflected back through the planets of Mercury and Venus and the moon. And it's especially uh, poured down onto the earth with the full moon, which we just had last night. And then in the egoic realm, in the six-dimensional realm, we have the zodiac. 